Uh, well, hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Halliday, and I'm pretty casual, so I prefer to be called by my first name, Chris. Um, just a little background, uh, I went to dental school in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at Marquette University, and right out of dental school, I joined the U.S. Public Health Service. So I uh, started the U.S. Public Health Service in late 1987, and my initial assignment was in Barrow, Alaska, which is in northern Alaska. And after uh, three years in the Arctic, I moved to the Southwest and I worked on the Navajo Indian Reservation for eight years in the Northwestern New Mexico and North uh, Eastern Arizona. And then I moved to Rockville, Maryland to work in the headquarters of the Indian Health Service. And uh, after oh, about 12 years in DC, I was asked to be the Chief of Staff to the Surgeon General. So the last Almost two years I was in Washington, D.C. I was working with Dr. Regina Benjamin, uh, the current Surgeon General, dealing mainly with policy-related matters, not necessarily oral health, but policy in general. And the reason I'm telling you that is because I'm going to relay a lot of the experiences I had in the public health service in these slides. Uh, I spent oh, about 23 years working with the American Indian Alaska Native populations, and that's a population group which experiences oral health disparities at a rate about three times the national average. So the American Indian Alaska Native children experience dental caries or cavities about three times the national average. And in some population groups like up where I was on the north slope of Alaska and also on the Navajo Indian Reservation, the dental caries experience rate in children, the prevalence is about 94%. 94% of the kids have experienced cavities. Either they have current active caries or they've had a tooth restored. And um, that's, if you run those statistics by a private practice dentist in the United States, those are uh, statistics which are unbelievable. A lot of the private practice dentists tell me they haven't seen oral disease rates like that since the 1950s and 60s before water fluoridation became as prevalent as it now is. So I'll, I'll relay a lot of my experiences with the Indian Health Service. And the reason I want to do that is because I found that the physicians in the Indian Health Service were usually the strong advocates outside of the dental program for oral health, you know, especially in the pediatric population groups. And uh, of all the physicians, the pediatricians were the ones that almost always came over to the dental clinic and uh, wanted to network with us. Let me just go back up here a little bit. Okay, so let's, um, I'm going to ruin your lunch first. So uh, I promise not to do this too much during the presentation, but uh, this is what in high risk population groups, the dentist and the physicians are going to see on a daily basis. Uh, meth mouth, I'm not sure if you guys have seen that much in your current assignments, but when I was on the reservations, the last 10 years I was on the reservations, started seeing a lot of meth mouth. And I also network a lot with the, in my previous job, with the dentist in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, so they saw a lot of this too. It's real nasty looking. Yeah. Um, but you know, you see, both in uh, pediatric populations as well as adult population groups, you're gonna see a lot of the active caries. It's, it's a mess. A lot of times it's unrestorable. You know, when you get to a condition like this where these teeth are decayed down to the gingival margins, uh, those teeth really are not restorable. And we're gonna get into some of the discussions about what sort of impact that has on children when they lose their teeth prematurely. So, okay, I promise no more gross pictures. Um, I can get, let me see if I can get this. There we go. So what we hopefully are going to work, the physicians and the dentists are going to work together so we can ideally have a population group a lot more like this, folks. Hopefully, ideally, without any active caries or cavities in their mouth. All right, a um, little bit of background. There's, there's all sorts of dental advocacy groups out there, and one of the strongest uh, advocates I know of is Ralph Ficillo, and Ralph uh, runs a group called DentaQuest. But uh, this is, I lifted all this information off some recent papers I found on the internet, but um, the point of this being is that oral diseases, especially cavities in the teeth, is, that's 100% preventable. And there is absolutely no reason that we have to have caries in these teeth. So it's a 100% preventable disease. And what I'd like to do is talk to you today about some prevention modalities and hopefully get you thinking about per, you know, partnerships that you as physicians can have with the oral health programs at the hospitals or ambulatory clinics that you'll be working with. Um, also, there's been a couple of high-level papers from the Surgeon General's Office on oral health. In the year 2000, uh, the uh, Surgeon General's report on oral health came out, 
you know, if anyone's interested, I could email you either a PDF of that report or I've got the, uh, the uh, executive summary of that as well. And then a follow-up to that initial report uh, that uh, Dr. Satcher put out, three years later, Dr. Richard Carmona put out a, a call to action on oral health. So the, the Office of the Surgeon General of the Department of Health and Human Services considers oral health to be a high priority uh, health need that needs to be addressed. And what's really encouraging is I'm not sure if any of you guys follow the healthy people objectives, but for the first time ever in the healthy people 2020 objectives, oral health has finally been listed by the federal government. In healthy people 2000 and healthy people 2010, those objectives had never listed oral health. But now the current uh, administration at the Department of Health and Human Services is raising the visibility of the needs to address oral health issues. <laughs> Um, okay, some of the take-home messages I'd like to have you think about. Maybe we can have some discussions during this presentation because I do in the second half of the presentation. I want to keep it a bit interactive. But some of the take-home messages, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, how primary care non-dental providers are in the I ideal position to address... Call one, two, oops, oops. So anyway, you all are in a prime positions to address the preventive needs and to uh, develop prevention programs for the population groups you're working with. Um, also, I want to have some discussions about how you feel primary care physicians could implement preventive practices that would be cost effective modalities to all the patients you treat. And I'm talking all the way from pediatric through geriatric population groups. Um, we also want to have some discussions about the fact that health disparities of all sorts exist in all population groups, uh, but I want to concentrate on the oral health discussions mainly on pediatric and geriatric population groups because I feel that they're in some ways at the largest risk and also in some ways are also the least able to defend their health conditions and need the most assistance. Um, and then also something I really need the physicians help with is there never really have been specific guidelines developed for oral, oral, oral health care and oral health prevention treatments for pregnant women and a lot of the clinics and hospitals I've worked at in the past they had you know varying degrees of rules well you know you can you know non high risk uh, pregnancies you can get them in during the second trimester and that's about it I mean I never really had any strong guidelines so I don't, I'm not sure if that's something that you all as a group would like to address or if you guys have any recommendations but I think the dental profession as a whole would really benefit partnering with medical providers to come up with some strong recommendations and guidelines for oral health care for pregnant women. Uh, let's see here. If I can get this door. Yeah, let's try this way. There we go. Um, okay, so once again, why, why are we here talking about oral health? Well, it is, it's a big problem. Uh, and like I mentioned to you earlier, there was a certain general's report that was published in the year 2000 with that follow-up call to action in 2003. Um, we also, in these reports, these reports highlight the widespread nature of these, once again, preventable diseases. The oral, uh, most oral diseases, whether it's oral cancers or caries, are almost completely preventable. Dental caries definitely is completely preventable. And then what I really need the help with the medical profession with, with the physicians is the fact that there just is not a sufficient number of oral health care providers in this country. Currently there are about 6,000 dentists per year that are leaving full-time practice in this country. Dental schools in this country are graduating about 4,200 to 4,500 dentists per year. So what we're seeing, even in this rough economy, we're still seeing more dentists leaving full-time practice than the dental schools are producing. So you'll get the point of this as I go through the slides, but I think the, the, the physicians are ideally placed to help fill this gap that the dental profession may not be able to address. Um, also, I want to have some discussions about the fact that the prevalence of oral disease is correlated with age. And once again, I mentioned the fact that pediatric populations and the geriatric populations are at highest risk. Uh, socioeconomic status, we're going to address that in these discussions as well. And then also, uh, the ability to access care will definitely impact the prevalence of oral disease rates in our population groups. 
And then uh, there's been all sorts of literature in the last 10 to 15 years about the association between oral health and overall health. Uh, for example, in general terms, there have been a lot of research done showing a strong association between oral health and cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease. There's a lot more emerging research on the correlation between oral health and low birth weight preterm babies and then diabetic population as well. And if, if we have time, I'd like to tell you about a kind of a, a really innovative program that a couple of my colleagues that are periodontists in the Indian Health Service have developed to address the oral health care needs of diabetic population groups. So if I don't bring that up and if we have time before, remind me to bring up this uh, pilot project we had in the Indian Health Service with diabetic patients. And then also we can have some discussions about the fact that uh, dental caries is a multifactorial disease process. So it, it links infectious uh, uh, parameters with environmental and behavioral factors. So all these tie together and kind of have the end result of dictating the status, oral health status of a population group. Okay, so let's do some kind of basic background and I apologize if some of this stuff is too basic for you, but uh, I just want to go through it real quickly. Uh, Bacteria strep mutans is a causative factor for dental caries and we're going to talk more about strep mutans as we go through these discussions but uh, what we're finding is in population groups that have high dental caries rates, more often than not they have these exceedingly high strep mutan counts in their mouth and this comes especially important as we talk about vertical transmission from mother to child of strep mutans. Um, also this strep mutan metabolizes fermentable car carbohydrates and the end result is that they produce bacteria which lead to the, the decay or erosion of the enamel and other tooth structures. And also then also fluoride as you well know from what you read in the paper or read in your studies, fluoride can help to strengthen the tooth structure. Fluoride can actually repair damage done to a tooth and help the enamel surface of a tooth remineralize. But we'll talk a little bit about fluoridation programs. There's some pretty cool and easy ways that physicians, nurses, pharmacists can get involved in the application of fluoride varnishes on children. Okay, uh, the current recommendations. And this is where I think the physicians could really help out the dental profession. And I'm going to back up a little bit. When I was with the Indian Health Service, what we found is the dentist in the Indian Health Service generally didn't see any of the children until the children were about three years of age. <clears throat> physicians, of course, are seeing these kids from day one. By the time the dentist saw these kids in the Indian Health Service, and this is echoed in a lot of other high-risk population groups, at three years of age, a lot of these kids have their primary teeth completely bombed out. I mean, I'm talking three-year-olds that have teeth rotted out to the gum line and there's no way to restore those teeth. So we're going to have some discussions here about uh, once again guidelines for oral health assessment in the well, whoops, well child visits as well as the uh, prenatal checkups for pregnant women. Uh, also we found, we've found through various studies that pregnant women, when they're advised by physicians or nurses or whoever in their, in their prenatal checkups about the need to have oral health care matters addressed, only about half of them actually have gone to seek treatment in the dental clinic. So that's one other way I'd you know, really appeal to the physicians to encourage those folks who do need dental care while they're pregnant to try to seek treatment. Right. And once again, that brings forth the need for those guidelines. Southwest. Can I get you to mute your mic? It's, it's For live. Now. For now. For now. Springfield? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys are yeah. out yeah. yeah. There you go. Very good. All right, thank you. Um, okay, also, uh, oops, this is on. Okay, gingivitis is the most common oral disease, especially with pregnant women. So about three quarters of pregnant women have uh, anywhere from moderate to severe gingivitis. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the research is now showing that oral conditions such as moderate to severe gingivitis could be an associating factor with uh, low birth weight preterm babies. Once again, it's just that whole idea of having that chronic infection in the body. Uh, m the mother's oral health, extremely important to me. If I could do nothing else while I'm here in Kirksville, I'd like to really see what we can do to bolster women's health programs and then pediatric oral health programs. Uh, but the uh, mother's oral health, once again, has been identified to be vital to the overall health of not only herself, but the developing fetus, as well as the neonate. 
And then, as I mentioned a few moments ago, vertical transmission, and I'll tell you a story about that. What I found when I lived in Alaska, I, li I lived in an Inupiat Eskimo community, and it was very common in that community as it was in the Navajo Indian culture for, for mothers or primary caregivers to pre-chew the food for a baby. And what we found basically, uh, the parents, that were pre-chewing this food were inoculating the children with these strep mutans. So there's no conclusive study that's been done on this, but we just found that we had children this a few months old, they're having their baby teeth just start to erupt, and they had these very unusually high counts of strep mutans in their mouth. This is something that wasn't seen in most other population groups. So a lot of speculation about this vertical transmission from mother or primary caregiver who are pre-chewing the food to the child, resulting in this kid being inoculated with strep mutans, and these you know poor kids are teeth at three months of age. They don't have a chance. These teeth are just getting ravaged by the bacteria and the acids that are produced by the bacteria. Uh, you guys could also help out the dental profession quite a bit during the pediatric visits, not just the pediatric dental visits, but the pre pediatric uh, medical visits. The uh, American Academy of Pediatrics recommends this first dental visit by six months of age. Like I told you earlier, not only in the American Indian Alaska Native communities, but in a lot of high-risk population groups, we're finding that these kids aren't making it to the dentist until they're about three years of age. So anything, uh, and we have, some, we have some strategies coming up in these slides, but anything that the physicians can do to help us develop strategies to raise the awareness of oral health needs with the parents and caregivers, as well as participating in some prevention modalities, that's going to help these kids a lot. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the big concern is that there's just an insufficient number of dental practitioners available in this country for the entire population. And what we're finding is that only about 3% of the dental providers in this country specialize in pediatric dentistry. Not sure how it is here in Kirksville yet. I've met most of the general dentists in Kirksville, but where I grew up and where I've worked in, uh, during my professional career, most of the general dentists would not see pediatric dental patients. So there's just not a you know, huge number of dental providers across the country to address the needs of these kids. You mean one not as in refused to see? Yeah. Yeah, they, they, you know, it's anything from, I don't know if you heard it on the, on the line there, but the question was, did they refuse to see these kids? And the answer is yes. Uh, I know a lot of dentists that just either don't feel comfortable treating pediatric patients or they feel that their time is better spent, in other words, being more productive, treating cosmetic adult patients. You say six months, what, I mean, how soon after, say, some kids don't have their teeth? So, I mean, how soon after their teeth start to look? Should they see it what we recommend is as soon as the first tooth erupts, let's get them by, just you know, have the mother come by the dental clinic, have the kid get used to sitting in a dental chair, someone opening their mouth, someone taking a look with the flashlight. You know, if we can start that early on. And one of the things I'd like to do is once we get the dental school running, if we can get dental students or whoever, faculty, to come over to the well child clinics and we can try this. We can just get the kids used to somebody taking a look at their mouth. Otherwise, these poor kids are going to show up in the dental clinic at three years of age, carries throughout their mouth, toothaches, feeling horrible, they're scared, and they got, you know, some guy or gal they don't know coming in looking in their mouth. I'm 37 and it still scares me. Well, you know what? <clears throat> yeah, well, I'm 52 and it still scares me. <laughs> I'm a dentist. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, but I'd like to see, if, you know, no later than the time that first tooth is erupting, if we can get these kids just to swing by the dental clinic or have a dental provider take a quick look. Um, uh, something else where the physicians can really help us out is the fact that it's more likely that your patients you see are going to have medical insurance than they will have dental insurance. So anything you could do to discuss uh, uh, prevention modalities or if you guys could be the one to be the first one to take a look in their mouth, that's fine with me. But you guys are going to see these kids probably a lot sooner than the dentists in your community will. Uh, let's see, um, United States Prevention Services Task Force. Uh, this, okay, this is going to be something that's a little bit politically volatile. It's a, it's a touchy subject, but water fluoridation and fluoridation in general. There's a uh, very strong anti-fluoride fluoride network in this country. The dentists deal with that on a regular basis. You very well may as well, but 
<clears throat> I'd like you to work with your local utility authorities to determine what the fluoridation rates are in the water, and that's assuming that your patients are drinking water from municipalities. You know, they may be getting their water from water wells. Now, where I've lived in the past, most municipal uh, water treatment plants, if you bring a water sample in from a well, they'll test it for you. I'm not sure if that's true in northeastern Missouri, something we can look into. but. Um, what we need to do, working together, the physicians, the nurses, and the dentists need to work together to figure out if these kids are drinking water that has fluoride. And if it is, we need to know if that water fluoridation level is excessively high or if it's low. And if, it, you know, if it's one or the other, we need to address the fact that the child's either ingesting too much fluoride through water or not enough. Do you have a question? Can you briefly address the reasoning behind the anti-fluoridation movement? I've never quite understood that. Well, <clears throat> I don't think I understand it either because it, it, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, you, 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 you hear all sorts, I mean, I've been to meetings and you hear all sorts of stuff. They'll talk about, well, you know, the, the anti-fluoridationists will say, well, are you familiar with the fact that fluoride is included in rat poison? Well, you know, you can make the argument drinking too much water could be hazardous to your health, too. It could be fatal. It, it's, it's a very tough argument to fight, but um, there, there are some reasons to be concerned about fluoride. And the, the bottom line is we just want to make sure that these kids are ingesting the recommended amount of fluoride. Um, you know, I mentioned on here about fluoride supplements. We need to be careful about that because if, if the physicians and the dentists working together decide that a child needs fluoride supplements, we need to make sure that the caregivers or the parents are adhering to the uh, dosage because too much fluoride is a bad thing. And, and one of the negative effects of too much fluoride, whether it's through water or for, through supplements or through young kids ingesting toothpaste. You know, they always tell young kids, spit the toothpaste out, but a lot of the kids will swallow it and then we also run the risk of the kid ingesting too much fluoride so one of the negative effects of over fluoridating anyone is especially with kids is it is the danger of getting what they call fluorosis or the damage to the enamel of the teeth so you've probably seen pictures or you may have seen patients before where their teeth just have this like mottled appearance the enamel the whitest part of the tooth is this mottled kind of cratered or it might be stained and I, I know you've probably seen things like tetracycline staining on the teeth but with mottled fluoride through fluorosis you get this kind of a moonscaped appearance to the tooth and some discoloration that could be an unfortunate result of over fluoridation. Uh, so we need to be careful. But I, I just ask if maybe you network with the dentists in your communities, try to figure out what the fluoride levels are in the local water supply. Um, talk with the dental providers to see if there may be a need to, uh, to adjust the fluoride level intake on any of your patients. Uh, let's see, I think I covered all that. Oh, this down here, just real importantly, when you're talking to parents uh, have young kids just make sure you reinforce a message that you know brushing the teeth is okay they don't need to put like a big old Dairy Queen uh, style swab on their toothbrush like you see on the TV commercials all you need for a child is a, pea, a, a dab of toothpaste about the size of a pea I'm literally about the size of a pea on the toothbrush um, have the parent help the child brush the teeth so the child gets used to doing that and, and you know remind the parent make sure the kid spits the toothpaste out. They really shouldn't be swallowing it. Chances are they're probably getting optimal amounts of fluoride through the water, water they're drinking. That's assuming they're drinking tap water, not bottled water, because some bottled water doesn't have optimal fluoride levels. Um, mouthwash too, that you see fluorid, um, fluoridated mouth rinses, mouthwashes. Just want to make sure the kids aren't swallowing, ingesting this. Uh, let's see. I'd really ask, you know, I think you're probably doing this already, but I'd really ask that the physicians incorporate an oral health history when you're examining your patients. Quick look in the mouth. Yeah, you know, and you know, if you guys want, we can do another in-service sometime and show you some slides. I've got all sorts of presentations on oral health screening we can do if, you, if you're interested. But if you could just inc you know, incorporate some sort of an oral health history and some sort of an oral health quick visual screening or examination in your physical examinations of the kids. Uh, also, if you can include oral health promotion disease prevention messages when you're meeting with the parents or caregivers. And, you know, I keep mentioning caregivers. Uh, I'm not sure how it is with the population groups you're working with, but when I was working working in Alaska, New Mexico, and Arizona, I found that chances are the biological parents were not 
the people raising the kids. It was quite often a grandparent, an auntie, or even sometimes an older sibling. So whoever is the caregiver for these kids, I just ask if you guys could help relay these health promotion disease prevention messages. Uh, I really want to work in this new dental school. I know AT Still University is prioritizing interprofessional education, but I want to have a real strong collaboration between the dental students and the osteopathic students too. So if you guys are interested, you know, we, I'd be glad to start something now. The dental students won't be here for a while still, but I just want to have a strong collaboration and have AT Still be noteworthy for being a university that really fosters a strong collaboration. Um, we have all sorts of continuing med medical education courses that the dental profession can offer. And I'm going to show you one coming up here in a couple of slides, but I, this website, I heard it was being developed, but I didn't even see it until yesterday when I was putting these slides together. Uh, but there's a website called uh, Smiles for Life. Let me, let me just go ahead and get to that. I'll get to it after this slide here. Uh, but it's a pretty cool website. I think you guys will like it. Uh, also, um, as far as earlier intervention programs go for the primary caregivers, as I mentioned before, if you can incorporate oral examinations and screening and risk assessments in your examinations of your population groups, not just the kids, but the adults too, you know, I really like that. And once again, uh, we'd be glad to help you know, set up sort of a training program. Uh, we want to make sure, that, and the, you know, this is something I really think the dental profession is responsible for. I think the dental profession generally has siloed themselves, the, the providers, into the dental profession. Um, I want to see the dental profession come out of the silo network with the physicians, the nurses, the pharmacists, whomever else it may be. So uh, I just want to you know, make sure that we have the dental providers involved with helping you guys with your jobs. And then between the dental providers and you all, let's see if we can detect these oral health problems early on, the dental caries or any other problems. And it, it, once again, I'm concentrating quite a bit on the pediatric population group, but we're going to have some bullets coming up here about adult population groups as well. Um, when you're doing your uh, screenings of the children, I just ask if you could uh, incorporate anticipatory, <coughs> anticipatory guidance for the caregivers. So just give the caregivers kind of an overall explanation about the importance of teeth. A lot of caregivers feel like baby teeth are going to fall out anyway. Why do you bother brushing them? Why do you bother taking care of baby teeth? Well, you know, the fact is if the kid loses their baby teeth prematurely, that's going to cause space problems for the permanent teeth when they come in. So if they lose those teeth early, when the permanent teeth come in, there's a greater chance they're going to be coming in all over the place. They're, you know, going to be snaggle tooth and all over the place. So we want to maintain those primary teeth as long as we can. Primary teeth are also important for uh, nutrition, for facial development, facial growth, um, for the child's ability to learn to speak their language, their, whether, if, whether it's English or another language. The kids need those teeth. So please impress upon parents and caregivers that primary teeth aren't expendable just because they get replaced by permanent teeth. We need to maintain them <laughs> as long as possible. Um, also, if you can do me a favor, talk to your parents and caregivers, once again, about appropriate methods of promoting a child's oral health, diet, um, you know, nutrition, oral hygiene. And then this is, this is somewhere, when I was at the Indian Health Service, we networked with all the pediatricians in the Indian Health Service. And by the time I left the Indian Health Service, we were expanding this to all the physicians, the nurses, and the pharmacists. But application of fluoride varnish. And fluoride varnish, it's just what it sounds like. It's, it's a varnish that contains fluoride, comes in a little vial with a little toothbrush. I mean, quite frankly, anyone could be trained to do this. Doesn't have to be a healthcare provider. You know, if I had my way, I'd train the head, head Start centers and school teachers to paint this on. But what you do is you said the child come in, take a two by two, dry off a tooth, get a little bit of this fluoride varnish on the brush, and you just paint them on the tooth. It doesn't hurt. It's got a little bit of a varnish smell to it for a few minutes. It's going to, you know, in some cases, it'll leave a little bit of a tint to the tooth for about 48 hours. And so you have this film of varnish on the tooth. After about 48 hours, a lot of it washes off, but enough of it sticks into the microtubules on the dentin and the enamel of the tooth. This stuff, this, this is good stuff. You, you can do a literature search on this. This has been used 
throughout Europe and most of the rest of the country for decades now. In the United States, it was used for like the last 20 years as a liner before you put a filling material on a tooth. But now the dentist and the oral health profession and the physicians are using this as a preventive modality applied topically to the tooth. This stuff works. It helps to remineralize damage that's already been done to the tooth. And it also helps strengthen the enamel which hasn't been damaged yet. So I mean this is as close as anything we have right now to being the silver bullet to try to minimize the damage. I don't want to say completely prevent, but minimize the damage from dental caries. So this is something else. If you guys are interested and if you, you know, I like to say the training session would take all of about 14 seconds, but if you guys are interested, we could probably line something like that up sometime. But this, this is big. I really like to see medical profession, nursing profession, the pharmacist, just because they have such easy access to population groups. I like to see everyone that we can train to use fluoride varnish. How often should you apply that? You know, it, 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 a lot of it depends on the risk factor and the child and population group. When I was in the Indian Health Service, we were doing it twice a year. It was an extremely high risk population group. Yeah. Do they do that at the school systems here? They do. They do they? Yeah, they go into the schools. Um, I'm not sure if it's twice or once, but they do. You know, that's pretty... Pr um, they hit the, the pediatricians and the dentists hit the school systems. This place is progressive, I'll tell you, because I, I just moved out here from Maryland and they're not doing that in the school systems of Maryland. I guess the health council yep. um, goes in and they do it. Well, my hat's off to them. And when you guys get out and practice in whatever community you'll be in, if you can keep that one in mind until something better comes along, this is a this is really good stuff. Yeah. Out of curiosity, is that only used for deciduous teeth and children? I'm sorry, is it only used? Only used in deciduous teeth and children. No, no, you can use them permanent tooth too. I mean, most of the adults could benefit from this as well. So it definitely has an effect of strengthening the enamel on the tooth. And in some cases, if you have a enamel on a tooth that's got a real incipient caries, a real small cavity starting in it, in some cases when you paint this on, it could actually reverse that process of the demineralization of the, uh, of the enamel. So no, not just deciduous. Uh, and especially, you know, once again, I keep harping on high risk groups, but if you're dealing with population groups that they don't have access to fluoridated water or, and or if they're not using fluoridated toothpaste, whatever it may be, if you think the child or the adult doesn't have, a, you know, sufficient access to fluoride, this varnish is good stuff. Cheap to buy, easy to apply, painless, easy. Most of the times, the kids usually aren't scared about it. You just, you know, say open up, dry off the tooth, paint it on. You can, you know, you can make up some sort of a thing for the kids, telling they're getting a tattoo on their tooth and paint it on. Uh, okay, this is that website I was telling you about. This is a pretty cool website. Um, we developed something like this in the Indian Health Service for non dental providers, but this one goes way beyond what we developed. This, this is a website that has developed oral health education materials for non-dental providers as well as educators. So it's got two buttons on the home page. So you click on this one, it pulls up the courses for the educators. This button here pulls up the courses for the providers. And you can't read it, but the, the listing of courses they offer over here, this is the listing of courses. So, um, you know, once again, the relationship of oral health to systemic health, <clears throat> child oral health, adult oral health, acute dental problems, oral health in the pregnant patient, carries risk assessment, fluoride varnish and counseling, the oral health examination, and then geriatric oral health, which is another hugely important topic to me. So I'd encourage you, to go to this website if you have time, check it out. It may be that, you know, in the, in the comfort of your own home, you could take a, you know, course online and just get it over with. And yeah, I think this is a really cool site. I'm excited about it. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, I'm, I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm going to start winding down pretty soon, but I'll try to make this a little bit more interactive. Uh, Right now, there's only about 38 states that reimburse primary care providers for preventive oral health, and that includes fluoride varnish. You know, that's unfortunate. It's too bad it's not all 50 states. And, and one of the problems we're finding is that of, of the 26% of children who have public dental insurance, of those children, only about a third of them, their caregivers have taken them to seek dental treatment. So what we have is, you know, we, yeah, we have a, a minority in the number of children who have access to public insurance, but of those few who do, two-thirds of them, their provider, or their uh, caregivers, 
aren't taking advantage of that public insurance. So these are kids that in theory could be receiving treatment, they're not receiving it. So you know, I'd like to ask you guys, you guys deal with similar problems on medical conditions. Do you, you have any ideas or strategies on how you as physicians can kind of raise the awareness of parents? I'll, I'll pick on St. Joe's. See, they're, are they still out there? Okay. St. Joe, um, what we're talking about here is, is the fact that you know, a minority in the number of children uh, have access to public insurance, let's say Medicaid insurance, for oral health treatment. And uh, of those few children that do have that type of insurance, about two thirds of those children do not get taken to a dentist for oral health care or for treatment. So do you guys have any uh, ideas on strategies on how you guys as physicians can raise the awareness amongst uh, parents or caregivers? I don't know, how, how, about the, how about the folks in Springfield? You guys have any ideas? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Cape Girardeau, how about you guys? Hi, Cape, how are you? Oh, man. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to make the folks in Kirksville look good. You guys have any ideas? Yeah. I've seen those oral health bands that go around to different clinics. Yeah. Like primary care clinics that seem to work well. And yeah. The day or week that they spend there and get some more awareness. You know, it's, you know, it's like yeah. Access in the school systems would be big too, just because both parents nowadays, both parents, are <coughs> they don't get off the four or five. Yep. And it's all closed. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not, I'm not sure if you guys on the on the teleconference line heard both those, but one of them was a suggestion about using mobile vans to take advantage of the use of mobile vans to reach out to different population groups, kind of an outreach program. And then another suggestion was to network with the school system to try to get healthcare providers or the messages, if not through healthcare providers, maybe through teachers, getting the messages out through the schools. Yeah. Or like for, you know, sports physicals are required yeah. before your participation in sports, so the school system can require and uh, have some sort of documentation that it's really not fulfilled this. Uh, that's getting pretty fascist. But. Well, it, you know, it, it, the suggestion was made that maybe the school district could be made such, or you know, dictate such, I shouldn't say dictate, but mandate such that the children's have an oral health visit prior to uh, enrollment any year. Um, yeah, it may sound a bit prescriptive, but you know, Head Start programs already have that requirement, so I think it's a good idea. So Head Starts are required for the kids to, you know, X percentage of the kids to get a screening in the first, whatever it is, 60 days of the school year, and X percentage of children are required to have a you know, patient treatment completed for oral health matters, so it's not a bad idea. I mean, it's easier than that, even is yeah. like when they come to their well child, mm -hmm. ask them, or actually look in their mouth, A. Yeah. A lot of physicians don't look in the mouth. Primary care provider, you should look in the mouth. Um, and then addressing that at your well child visit. So, I mean, and that can be through adult visits too. Yeah. And I mean, I know I had a patient who we see a lot of like mentally disabled, and I was doing a physical exam, and I looked in someone's mouth, and their mouth, their teeth were like rotting out. And the caregiver was like, no one's ever looked in his mouth before. Wow. I was just astounded that I even looked in his mouth, and I was like, yeah. he's got a ton of cavities, he needs to go see a dentist. That's um, great. Then he was going to go the dentist, you know, because they need orders for everything, but, I mean, just someone not even, like, looking in someone's mouth. Yeah. Like, so that, in, that's something the primary care providers should be doing, mm -hmm. so we just need to be better about actually doing it. Well, and then that's a great suggestion. I said great meaning that's a great suggestion, not great that they had a mouthful of caries, but it, you're absolutely right. And, and that's something I'd really like to see the dental profession. It's like what? You need to, and that, you know, yeah. Other doctors, you know, yeah. Before. Yeah. Like what? It's just it's crazy. You know, I don't know if you guys out in the field could hear that, but the suggestion was made that we just have to uh, include oral health components in the screening and examinations of these kids. You know, you know something else we did when I was with the government was we would also have a dental hygienist who, by the way, dental hygienists are trained to be educators, so they're perfect for a lot of these roles. But we would have a dental hygienist go to the well child clinics and the prenatal clinics, and once a week or so, we'd have a dental hygienist there, and the hygienist would 
give you know information to these expectant mothers about what the importance of oral health and we'd also had a timeline about when the child should first be seen by dentist and some little helpful tips on you know things like getting um, you know finger cuts to wipe off the baby teeth as they start to erupt but you're absolutely correct it should be incorporated in the medical visits uh, yes I think um, awareness just in general because I mean, personally, I, didn't, I don't take my kids to the dentist until they were three. Yeah. So if I didn't know they were supposed to go at six months or when they get the first two, most likely the general population doesn't know that either. Yeah. My dentist actually even tells me not to bring them until they're three. Wow. So if the dentists are out there telling people not to bring them until they're three, then the general population probably doesn't, yeah. isn't aware enough to even do that. So. Yeah. You're correct. And, and it very well may be in those population groups we're talking about that's relatively low risk and the dentist may not be seeing kids with caries and primary teeth. But I'm telling you, high risk groups and, and the oral health disparities, the rates are increasing in certain population groups across this country. You know, in high risk population groups, I want us to get these kids familiar with having their mouth looked at and hopefully having a dentist or a hygienist taking a peek at the mouth early on. And I know we're getting pretty close on time here, so I'm going to zip through a couple more slides here. Uh, if you didn't know this already, this is kind of a shocking statistic, or not statistic, but fact. Uh, the most common disease in adults and children is dental caries. And the most common chronic disease in children, dental caries, five times more prevalent in children than asthma. Um, the last bullet here shows a statistic saying prevalence of caries rates has increased. Well, I'm telling you, I came from working with the government in a population group, high risk obviously, but the population group I was dealing with on the North Slope of Alaska, they had 94 to 96% of the kids had experienced caries by the age three. I used to see kids all the time in Alaska, three and a half years old, that had had every single primary tooth extracted because by three years of age they've been rotted out so badly there was no way to restore those teeth. And you know, it, it's horrible. Um, dental, let's see, um, I, I spoke, I touched on this earlier, but amongst other problems, caries will create chronic pain in the mouth. It could negatively impact the nutritional up intake of these kids, uh, increase school ab absenteeism, also, parents or caregivers having to miss work, take the kids in for toothaches. Um, the social and behavioral impact on these kids is horrible. I mean, if a kid's got a mouthful of gnarly looking teeth, um, you know, they're going to be hiding their teeth. It, it very well may impact their social and behavioral development, their ability to learn to speak properly. I mean, there's just a huge number of reasons that we need to increase the awareness of the importance of oral health. Um, if you want to read a really sad story, um, you know, Google. Diamante Driver. The Diamante Driver was a 12 year old boy in the Washington D suburbs in Maryland five years ago. He, his mother, he had a toothache and an abscessed tooth and his mother could not find a dental provider in the area to extract the tooth and the $80 procedure. She couldn't find any dentist willing to take him. Um, he ended up getting admitted to the hospital he went to the ER twice for this abscessed tooth. Uh, the second or third time they admitted him, the abscess had traveled to his brain. He had, you know, the neurosurgeon came in, worked on him. Uh, he died. But he died, you know, the etiology basically was an abscessed tooth. It started with an abscessed tooth. So, you know, a uh, decayed tooth killed this young guy. So, you know, if you really want to. You know, not, not an uplifting story, but if you want to read a sad story, read about Diamante Driver. They're, if you Google it, you'll get a Washington Post story on it. Um, okay, in addition to pediatric patients, you guys well know as physicians, the impact that tobacco and alcohol use has on the oral health and the overall health as well. Um, you know, the oral pharynx, uh, you know, squamous cell carcinoma. 75% uh, of all oral cancers are attributable to tobacco and alcohol. Most of them are, you know, manifest themselves as asymptomatic squamous cell carcinomas. It's just another reason to take a look in the mouth. Um, a, lot of, a lot of literature out there showing the associations between environmental factors. This one, tobacco, kind of blows me away. I'm still I'm doing a little more reading on that one. but. Um, 
just the message is we need to increase the awareness and the need for these um, anticipatory guidance sessions with parents and caregivers, prevent messaging and routine screenings. Um, zero stomia, you guys are well aware of, but you know, any patients or any medications leading to dry mouth, those patients also exhibit increased caries rates. So if there's any alternative drugs to limit the amount of dry mouth, especially in the elderly, that could maybe help maintain the few teeth that some of the elderly have still. Uh, you know, kind of take home messages. You just want to make sure that we integrate oral health into overall health. I'd love to work with KCOM on any kind of policies or procedures that you guys think would help physicians in training as well as once you're in practice outside of the university. And I, you know, I think this is a great opportunity for the you know, KCOM and the Missouri School of Dentistry and Oral Health to collaborate. You know, once we get some dental students here on site, I'd love to get them interacting with KCOM students. So, you know, I, I know that's kind of all over the board, but I just want to give you a quick overview of oral health. And if there's any questions, I'm going to stick around. I, I know you guys have tight schedules, though. So any, any comments or questions? Yeah, I, I suggest yeah. free dental care for residents. <laughs> yeah? Any <laughs> some sort of educational program. Yeah. So, so my... I second that. <laughs> so, so, so the... Uh, Introductory course in clinical dentistry. You guys could be the patients. Yeah, you bet. Sure. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be the guinea pig. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we'll see what we can work out. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's always fun to have people come over when the, you're training dental students on injection techniques. That's that's a lot of fun. <laughs> as long as they come over and we can practice central lines. <laughs> you know what, what's fair is fair. Maybe we should have you guys practice mandibular blocks on them too. So you guys can do infiltration and blocks on them as well. Yeah. Well listen, um, I'm just next door over, next door. I'm in the basement underneath the president's office. If you guys ever have any questions, you're welcome to come over. If you see me walking around town or hanging out at the Super Walmart, just feel free to come up and say hi. Um, you know, my name's Chris. I, I, they're pretty laid back, so I just prefer to go by first names. You know, give me a call. Uh, you can find me in the directory, the email directory, if you want to shoot me an email. If you guys have any ideas on how the dental profession could come out of that silo and better network with physicians, I'd love to hear them. So, thanks a lot. Thank you.